Anything, Jesse? Mm -hmm. Hi. So good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. This is kind of a, a <laughs> unique opportunity that we have um, to be joined by Duke Energy Indiana's president, Stan Pankar. So Stan, thank you for being here. Thank you. Very We're, we really kind of like these opportunities to be able to connect with our, um, you know, our great utility partners. We, we have to deal a lot with Rick Berger here locally. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's, it's, it's nice to see other faces <clears throat> <laughs> and be able to connect a That's little bit. That's why I'm here. I'm here to apologize. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Rick Burger apology yeah, tour. Yeah, I like right. it. No, uh, we we have you know several great people on the call today and some questions lined up that pertain to several areas that are really important to our community, industry, um, infrastructure development within the city, county, solar projects, all of those kinds of things. So you're going to Absolutely. receive a lot of questions yeah, of, regarding those today. Uh, today's format is pretty informal. Everybody on the call, if, if you have a question, it would be better though if you submit it in the chat. Um, and then I'll be reading those off at the end and allow Stan an opportunity to, to answer some questions. I think we have a peg till about 10 o'clock, uh, maybe okay. a little bit before. We'll try and wrap this up, but we hope to have some good conversation. So I'll give you your official introduction now. So Stan Pinnegar does serve as president of Duke Indiana's Ener Duke Energy's Indiana Operations. There we go. And which is the state's largest electric utility, serving approximately 840,000 customers in 69 of Indiana's 92 counties. Resp you are responsible for the financial performance of Duke Energy's regulated utilities in Indiana. Indiana, in addition to managing regulatory affairs, government relations, and community affairs, just a few small tasks on your plate on a daily basis. He also has responsible responsibility for advancing the company's legislative and regulatory strategies and integrated resource planning. Um, Pitagar, you are a you did earn your bachelor's degree from Indiana University and a Juris Doctor from Indiana University McKinney School of Law in Indianapolis. I didn't know that. Good to learn. He's a graduate of Duke Energy Strategic Leadership Program and currently serves as executive sponsor of Duke Energy Indiana's Leadership Development Network. So Stan, we're very grateful Thank to you have you here with us today. So I'll turn it over to you. I think you had some opening <clears throat> comments you wanted to get started with. Well, you yeah, thank you very much and uh, appreciate that. And the cameras, I'm getting used to the camera here, so give me a, a moment, but I'm going to look up. And... <laughs> they know, they understand the camera situation and, uh, at the chamber. It's not ideal. We're making uh, it work, though. And thank you all for joining. I really appreciate it. And we look forward to answering your questions. Rick's, uh, Rick's ready to answer anything that you have to ask. Um, <laughs> right, Rick? Yeah, that's right. And it's a pleasure to be here. I drove in last evening and... Um, it was still daylight, and I came in from the east and uh, uh, on 40. And I, Mayor, I, the city is looking great. Uh, that's my report. I uh, drove around some, and uh, I, it's credit to you and I know your team and many that are with us, uh, just how good the city looks. And I can see progress um, either already established or underway. So congratulations. It's, um, you know, when... I say that in a lot of different ways uh, to congratulate you all, but also uh, it's good for us too. You know, when our communities are are growing and thriving, it's it's good for our utility as well. And you know, it's important for us to invest uh, in our communities. And and I'm proud, you know, today to be here, and I'm proud to to say that's what we're doing in Terre Haute. Um, I thought uh, quickly. I just mentioned a few things that we're focused on. One is uh, infrastructure. We're um, we are in the process, we either have or we're in the process of uh, upgrading seven area substations, which is very important for reliability. Um, we're working on three important transmission lines, making sure that uh, they are uh, current and modern uh, in nature. Another reliability component, very important. Notably, your underground system here, which is a bit unique for us. This is um, the only uh, community where we have a substantial underground uh, system, uh, and uh, we're uh, <clears throat> we're in in progress of upgrading this underground uh, electric system that's been underground for a very long time, and, and we know it's needed. So that's a priority mm -hmm. of ours. And then there's a lot of you know another important element of, of reliability is is vegetation work, and sometimes I'm sure. You, you encounter this. That's not the most uh, popular <laughs> topic to talk about, but it is, uh, it's by far the uh, number one uh, component with respect to, to uh, reliability of power. So uh, that's another priority of ours. We are investing here also from an economic development standpoint. 
you know, our team, uh, and I know Rick is engaged in this as well, but uh, Misty McCammick and, and the rest of the economic development team is highly engaged here with your, your local and regional groups. And we we're proud to be partners uh, in a lot of different ways. And that takes a lot of different forms, right? It can be um, uh, engagement, it can be financial support. It, we have a, a rider that's often used for, uh, for new entities that are, um, or growing entities that uh, is beneficial uh, to the whole uh, equation of bringing um, a new prospect or, or helping uh, a current prospect grow. So that's important. And, um, you know, just community support. Uh, Rick had uh, given me some information that just this year through April, we've contributed over $130,000 to various, and that's in the region, but yeah. Uh, to various uh, entities ranging from uh, primary and secondary, post-secondary schools uh, right here in Terre Haute to Little League uh, support. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a wide uh, variety of, uh, we're going to announce five uh, new grants uh, this after, later this morning that we're really pleased uh, about. So that's uh, very important to us as a company and, and our our community, you know, as I, I've had this role, as you read, for almost, well, two and a half years, and the community element of this uh, uh, work that we do is hugely important to me. And I, uh, you know, the fourth, uh, the fourth uh, way we invest in uh, our communities is uh, through Rick Berger mm -hmm. and the engagement uh, that he, I don't know how many boards you're on around here. You've probably lost you. track, <laughs> but I hope you can really contribute to all those you're on. I know you can, but you know, we, uh, I noticed one of Rick's peers joined us as well, but uh, the, um, the, uh, the engagement that uh, I think that's her, I, that's her name. Uh, maybe you have a board member with the same name. Who? Lisa Huber. Lisa. Oh, yes. yeah. Lisa. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, oh, okay. you know, uh, I know Rick does a great job, and the there are Rick has eight peers that do similar work, you know, around mm -hmm. our service territory, and uh, and he is the dean, and he is the model that um, that all all the rest of want to emulate, and uh, so thank you, Rick, for your engagement here. So, we're pleased to I'm pleased to be here with you all today, and and uh, I'm pleased to. You know that that Duke is uh, a good partner in the region. Yeah, well, you certainly are, well, and thank I, you. I, we greatly appreciate you taking the time to join us a little bit and answer some questions. Okay. And I'm glad you gave some some shout outs to our friend Rick here. We do give him a lot of grief, but he is a true <laughs> asset to this Absolutely. community. So. I know he is. <laughs> thank thank you. you. Well, we'll go ahead and get things started with Mayor Bennett, who's joining us in person today. <laughs> good to be here. <laughs> Mayor, do you have any comments you'd like to make or, or questions for Stan? I, I guess just a couple quick comments. Um, just really appreciate the partnership. I mean, I would say that uh, responsible utility would be a, a great uh, description for me. Um, I mean, we just had an outage at the wastewater treatment plant a couple of weeks ago. It only it isolated just for us, which is a huge deal. And, you know, immediate phone call to Rick and you know, 10 minutes later, you're finding exactly what's going on and they fix it. That's not always the case. And we deal with a lot of folks. And so, um, just really appreciate that kind of relationship we have. We're working on a project on 3rd Street right now, US 41, to replace the lighting. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in phase one of four phases on that. And of course, we've got other proposals on the table to look at upgrading the LED lighting elsewhere in the city. Um, so we're always doing something. Sure. You know, there's always yeah. some activity, moving lines for road expansions. I mean, you name it, we're always interacting with Duke Energy. Just appreciate the professionalism and the assistance that we get to get through that because it's never easy. There's always challenges. Uh, but when you mentioned and you talked about uh, upgrades, I'm, I'm interested in that a little, hearing a little bit more about that specifics sure. because um, reliability and, and being able to not worry about power outages is, I think, a big deal. Uh, I live out on the east side and we periodically have issues out there the way it's structured and our power's all underground, yet what feeds it is above ground. And so Power goes out, you know, several times a year and, and have these conversations, but yeah. there's just pockets around like that. Yeah. So just wondering kind of what that infrastructure yeah. improvement looks <clears throat> like kind of overall and where you guys are going with that. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, and thank you for your 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 first uh, your first set of comments. It's greatly appreciated. Um, I, I don't 
hear that all the time from mayors. Uh, so <laughs> I, I really appreciate it. I'd tell you if it wasn't. I know you <laughs> would, absolutely. Um, so over the last six years, we've had an opportunity to really focus on infrastructure. There was a statute passed by the General Assembly that actually requires us to focus on uh, infrastructure in a big way, both transmission and distribution. And uh, it incentivizes utility actually uh, to, to hone in on, uh, on T&D work. Uh, and uh, that was passed, as I mentioned, about seven years ago. And so we began our first program, and you have to file, uh, not to get into the weeds too much, but these are kind of done in like seven year increments. You file plans where you identify areas that need, uh, that you know needs work and you implement the plan obviously over a period of time. And uh, so we're in that first uh, planning, seven year planning that we had, we focused on old infrastructure. We tried to focus on infrastructure that we knew was aging. Um, and as we transition into our second uh, project phase, which will begin in um, early 2023, we are uh, squarely focused on reliability projects. We have, um, and just as you had spoken, we're, we're identifying uh, reliability problems on our system uh, in all different phases. It could be residential, it could be uh, industrial or commercial areas where we know, you know, through our engagement or through our data, right? We, we know where these uh, where these uh, pain points are on our system. And so as we begin our second infrastructure plan uh, in 20, the beginning of 2023, it'll be focused squarely on those uh, areas where we know we have uh, more reliability problems than others. And so I, I think that we're, you know, I, you know it's interesting uh, as part of our first phase, uh, we've deployed uh, a lot of technology that, um, that if you've, if you've noticed an outage where uh, the lights will flicker seemingly three or four times, mm -hmm. like in a matter of maybe a minute, and you keep thinking, well, good, the power's back on. Oh, no, it's off. Oh, there it goes. Well, that's actually working. That means <laughs> it, 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 we haven't done a good job of educating on this, but that happens now because of the technology we've deployed. And that means that the power is being diverted from a line that is, is impacted to another line that uh, can still provide the service. And so while that seemingly four or five flickers uh, that can be frustrating, that's avoiding an, a longer outage. And so, um, and I, we get asked that a lot, you know, my lights flickered off and on, you know, four or five times and uh, something's not right. And I, the actual answer is, yeah, it, it, that means the system is is working by diverting the power from the impacted line to a, another line that can provide you with continual power. So there's lots of, you know, uh, just lots of opportunity to take care of the issues that you identified. And that's squarely where we're focused mm -hmm. heading forward. So thank you. And I know the streetlight um, issue we had, uh, you know, some issues again with older infrastructure where uh, when we had put uh, new poles in place to help uh, with your lighting, uh, we had found, I think that some of the street light um, facilities were intermingling with our, you know, our lines and it caused uh, probably some heartburn for you and, and your team, but I think we have that resolved now and looking forward to moving forward. So thank you. We are too. Our next question, we'll turn to the Zoom camera a little bit awkwardly. Uh, we have Vigo, one of Vigo County's newest commissioners, Chris Schweitzer, who's also a member of the Chamber's Board of Directors, Hi, who's joining us this morning. So Chris, questions or uh, comments for Stan? Yeah, I'd like to echo what Mayor Bennett said. Uh, Stan, we have a great partnership with Duke Energy and we're very thankful for that. Um, also, I'd like to give props to Rick. Rick is fantastic and a huge asset to this community. We can text or call Rick anytime and ask him questions and he will take care of it immediately. So I don't know if you have Rick's at every community, but Rick is a great man and we're fortunate to have him here in our, our area. That's the question. Keep <laughs> One of a kind. <laughs> oh, thank you. I appreciate hearing that. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> there's, there's some notes that maybe Rick is up for a review and that's what's happening today, but go ahead. Okay, so I'm sure- Has Rick's name been- County Council has given a- 
We digress. He's Go a, ahead, Chris. <laughs> he's a pretty popular guy, so. Um, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you're aware the county council gave an abatement for a solar farm in Southern Vigo County. Um, can you kind of tell us how that will impact Vigo County's future in the city of Terre Haute? And if there's a way to have educational activity from our higher eds to be involved with this project or the future of it? And uh, how can we all be involved in this? Yeah, well, Commissioner, congratulations on your your role, your new role. Um, yeah, thank you. I hope it's going well. Um, and uh, thank you for your comments uh, about the utility and Rick, I really do appreciate that. Um, so I, I wanted to make one distinction. I can talk about the, the solar farm, but um, it, this gets very confusing. We have a, a regulated side, which I'm responsible for, and then an, a not, an unregulated side, which um, I don't have a lot to do with. Um, you know, we Rick obviously was involved in that project and we were pleased about that, but uh, it's a different segment of our company. But that doesn't mean, you know, it's not, you know, I'd like to speak about everything that's going on at Duke. So. Uh, we were pleased uh, uh, with the uh, the outcome the other evening, obviously, and and this is um, it, this is a, a it, I think you all should feel proud about this. It's an economic development. You know, I, there's a lot of different views on uh, use of uh, the General Assembly just debated this for four months, right? Just a little bit. Uh, yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of different views uh, uh, on this topic it, around uh, the state, certainly, but uh, it certainly can be a, a very helpful economic development project from the standpoint of um, tax revenue and, um, and uh, an influx of jobs, uh, certainly uh, as the construction will be undertaken. And so for, uh, for Duke, generally, this is the first uh, major uh, renewable project that we've had in Indiana. So it speaks well of your community to, to entertain it. And, um, and, you know, ultimately, I know you're, I'm, uh, probably every elected official heard about this in one way or another. I know that these uh, sometimes aren't easy, yeah. but um, so it's a big investment. Uh, it will generate um, uh, almost 200 megawatts of, of power when the sun is sh shining. And, um, and so uh, the, the plan for that farm will be to uh, build it. And then what our unregulated uh, utility does, we'll look for a buyer uh, for that, um, for that generation, it could be another utility. Uh, it could could be us. Uh, there's some affiliate issues there, but it could be us if the commission would um, would see through that. Um, it could be uh, an entity that's looking for, you know, obviously green uh, generation um, at least during the daytime. So there's lots of opportunities, and and um, I I don't know the answer. I would assume that there would be opportunities for. Uh, groups to uh, maybe you know Rick if this has been discussed. I, I yeah uh, during that and Chris you bring up a good point there. We have talked about it. Tyler Coombs, yeah. you know, uh, we've made a commitment there'll be an educational system out there. And I know, you know, Rob out there, Rose Hallman. I mean, I, I think it's an opportunity for all kids and students to have a learning center out there. Okay. So it looks like we will be a partner in doing something like that. good. Yeah. yeah, and you know. Uh, Generally, what generally happens with these solar facilities is once they're established, then uh, you, you can very easily see battery storage uh, associated uh, with, particularly with solar, you know, uh, obviously we know wind solar is, gener is generating power. So it's important as it evolves that there, uh, there could be substantial you know, battery storage there to um, <clears throat> to allow for the storage of power for use uh, when the sun isn't shining or in, in, in the evening. So that could be an ancillary uh, element of, uh, and, so, and many times is, of a solar facility. So that could be another opportunity, certainly to, to have a learning, um, uh, learning engagement with, uh, with the entire facility, it mm -hmm. seems to me like. So thank you for your question. And, and comments, Commissioner. Thanks, Chris. All right, next up we have uh, Brian Koistra, who is also a member of the Chamber's Board of Directors and was with Garmon Construction, a okay. local developer. So Brian, turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Kristen. And Stan, if it's rare to get 
compliments from elected officials, it's probably even more rare to get one from a contractor. Uh, yeah. uh, you, you got that right. <laughs> we're we're doing some right. work downtown that interfaces with the underground network you mentioned previously. Um, okay. This really went well, and uh, a lot of that is the work of your people. So I appreciate that. Are um, you recording this, Rick? <laughs> no, I'm not recording. <laughs> Only the parts where we say good things about him. <laughs> okay. yeah. So I've, I've got two questions. The first is, I'd like to know more about how the process works when Duke determines who pays for bringing electrical service to a building, whether it's, it's Duke or the building owner, and how does that process work? Yeah, so thank you for your question. We have a revenue test that we use and it's standard really uh, amongst utilities where uh, if, um, if the revenue generated by the new customer it, uh, uh, over two and a half years would, be, uh, would, would pay for the infrastructure, then, uh, then it's on us. If, uh, if it's not going to meet that test, we will deduct um, the two and a half, we will deduct the real revenues from the two and a half, we'll, we'll deduct the, the revenues from the expenses and, and then charge the, um, the, uh, the developer the difference, if that makes sense. Um, now, it can get a little complicated and what, help, what would help is if there were additional customers that could, could, this is a new line you're speaking about, right? New facilities. So right. if, if additional customers could be brought on to that, uh, that system, then that would alleviate, that would, additional customers can account for that two and a half percent revenue test. It wouldn't have to just be the, the initiator. So, uh, and that really has been um, the way that we have handled it uh, for historically for many years. And it's a, a bit of an industry standard that that is kind of the calculation that's used. And, uh, you know, if you haven't found the right people at Duke uh, to work through that with you, uh, I know that we would be happy uh, to help facilitate that. Um, you know, I, I know that can be uh, a bit of a daunting um, uh, request of you to, you know, kind of figure out on your own, but, you know, we have mechanisms, you know, to evaluate how that revenue test would be, would apply, you know, to your plans. Mm -hmm. Is that helpful or uh, is it, that? It is, because prior to your comments, I thought Rick just made a number up and, and passed <laughs> it. So. Well, does it, it I, feel better. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Mariah. Well, maybe you don't want to talk about it, but uh, is there a, um, have you run that test yet for your project? Or it, it depends. It's a variety of projects. It, it was more just in general, how does the process work? Because you know, we're we're a commercial contractor and every project's a little bit different. Um, and I was just curious how Duke looked at that and, and developed those yeah. costs. Well, you know, it raises a broader issue that I think may be worth a minute to just talk about, we get asked a lot, you know, um, frankly, we get asked by some of the mayor's peers uh, about undergrounding of our facilities, mm -hmm. right? And it, it, it's particularly in downtown qu corridors and it's very expensive to underground facilities. Uh, it's hugely expensive. The, the maintenance uh, after uh, it's in the ground is sometimes problematic. And, and we'll often be asked, why won't the utility absorb those costs? And, um, you know, if we absorb the cost, that means that our customers, you know, we put that into our rate base. That means that our customers in, in New Albany are paying for uh, undergrounding in, you know, whatever town uh, that is requesting the undergrounding. And, and there's an equity issue there. And the commission, you know, we're highly regulated by the utility commission, and they wouldn't like that formula either. And so it's a similar, I think it, it's a little similar to your situation where, you know, you're looking to develop and we're trying to provide a means for that to happen based on the revenue uh, that would be generated. But beyond that, if it doesn't meet that test, that means we're rate basing that cost and, and spreading it, you know, to others who aren't benefiting necessarily from that particular development. I know that sounds, um, you know, your development isn't going to make or break, you know, the other 839,000 customers. I get that. But, um, 
you know, if, if everybody was following that model, then, you know, the, the, the revenue requirements would be um, kind of perverted, I think, a, a bit. So yeah. I hope that helps. Uh, I know the way we do business sometimes isn't logical and the way we're regulated, but um, I hope that, that that helps a little bit. No, that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, Thank second, you. Question, second question is in regards to incentive programs that Duke offers. Could you speak a little bit, maybe just in general, uh, some of those programs specifically um, to my interest would be commercial property owners and how uh, those programs work and, and what um, what types of equipment or, or materials account for that? Yeah, well, I would, if you're at the early stages of your development, which it sounds like you are, <clears throat> um, I would highly recommend you get with our energy efficiency group uh, and have a discussion, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, have a discussion with them about <clears throat> elements of your planning that we can help with uh, from an energy efficiency standpoint. And uh, you can get <clears throat> great discounts on, uh, uh, on on elements of energy efficiency that can be part of your uh, development. And that's a big one. And sometimes it's lost out because, you know, you don't think about it until the project's done. I know energy efficiency, it, efficiency in all manners is now maybe more front of mind than it used to be, but it's a lot easier to have that discussion and get the biggest bang for the buck, I think on the front end, uh, as you're thinking about your development. So that's a major one, and it can be a big money saver uh, for you uh, because we have programs uh, that are sanctioned by the state, um, and uh, we have very good people who who help with these programs who can you know help you find the right mechanisms for your development. So that's a big one. Um, you know, the other incentive that I spoke about earlier is um, a little more based towards. Uh, industrial, you know, larger load um, incentives. We have a rider that, um, again, is for new or growing uh, entities, and uh, there can be a, uh, and I don't know the breadth of your development, but uh, generally speaking, it's for larger loads, um, uh, you know, uh, bigger commercial or certainly industrial loads. So I'm not sure if it if you think that you might be within a, you know, uh, a realm of um, higher load commercial, then uh, by all means, uh, let's get you in touch with Misty Mechanic, and she could, uh, our economic development person in this area, who uh, perhaps could help you uh, think through that. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. And if uh, you can find, if I mean Rick can help you with this, but our website, uh, go to. Uh, the Duke Energy website, it's uh, sm uh, Smart Saver, Small Business Energy Saver, or Smart Saver, one of the two. Smart Saver. Smart Saver, yes. You know, Garmel certainly has a lot of projects going on in the community, but one you stayed right next door to last night um, here in downtown Terre Haute, which is the new convention center. Oh, yeah. Saw the, uh, so. Congratulations. Saw the um, depiction of that in the lobby of the hotel. Yeah. Looked great. Yeah. We're hey, very Brian, excited. Yeah, Brian, if you get Give us a uh, one minute update from staying on the convention center. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's an exciting downtown project that you and the mayor and everyone's working with. Sure. So the two most important things, it's ahead of schedule and under budget. So we'll <laughs> put, out, yeah. put that out there first, but um, it's moving right along. We're on pace to wrap up in uh, March of next year. Um, roofs on, glass should start, or window frames should start going in probably next week, uh, there's limestone uh, being laid, interior walls are taking shape, uh, some drywall starting to get hung. Uh, the parking garage just kind of miraculously sprouted up out of the ground in the last couple months. So um, it looks like it's done, but there's still a lot of work to do on the, on the parking garage. But uh, now the project, uh, it is moving right along and excited to uh, to get it wrapped up and get some people in there. Thank, Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you.
take a look at it on my way out. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> Drive you past it. You, you, I'm sure you were looking at your name and lights on one <laughs> side, but the other side is <laughs> the project. Uh, next, we're going to turn it over to another Stan, Stan Miles, who is with Novellus, a local okay. manufacturing company. Um, Stan is also the, uh, the lead for our local manufacturing council. So it's a group of all of our manufacturers here locally that meet once a month, every other month, something along those lines, and, and just connect on a variety of issues. So Stan has a few questions from that group. So Stan, take okay. it away. All right. Uh, thanks, Kristen. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Stan, nice to meet you. Thank uh, you, Stan. Too. <laughs> Rick does a really good job. Uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, we could always count on Rick to show up at the plant uh, at least once a year, giving us business updates as to what's going on. So. Uh, we look forward to getting through the uh, pandemic and hopefully having him back in the plant sometime this year. And then if I can get your, your approval, Stan, maybe he can buy us lunch during his next visit, if you can go ahead and approve that today. <laughs> well, they already know my expense again. They approve it. They do. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, absolutely. Lunch, lunch for everybody. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so uh, no Novellus is looking at uh, reducing its global footprint and so uh, we have uh, from the corporate office today, Mr. Kaizuki Akazaki, and I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. We've not had a chance to meet. Uh, he's from our global office located down in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. So uh, I would like to turn it over to him. He's got a couple of questions that uh, he would like to ask. And so uh, Mr. Okazaki, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, first of all, okay, thank you very much for for, uh, for inviting me for this. Uh, one thing that, okay, and uh, good to hear from, from, from Duke that uh, you are working on an improvement of the reliability of the transmission line. That's that's a good point, yeah. Uh, he yeah. got the question, yeah. Uh, he got the question. Uh, first, you, actually, we ha I, I have four questions, but I, I'm gonna try to summarize in two questions, okay? First one is related to more to the industry or uh, for the incentive from the Duke, okay? What kind of incentive the Duke's smart saver program can provide to, to, to the industry like uh, Novelis? And how can we apply for this incentive and what is the requirement to be eligible? And beside the, uh, this, is there any other incentive program for the industry? That's the first question, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so for energy efficiency, for an industrial facility, correct? Yeah, okay. yes. So you have to, uh, to be eligible, you have to make sure that you are opted in to the program. Um, okay. there, there was a statute passed um, uh, four or five years ago, where it gave industrial customers the opportunity to opt out of the energy efficiency program, which meant <clears throat> you were no longer uh, paying through your rates uh, the, um, the portion of the energy efficiency uh, costs uh, that we incur to do these programs. And I suspect you may have opted out. Uh, I'm not, I don't, we can check on that and we'd be happy to most industrials decided to opt out at that time because I think they figured that they could do their own energy efficiency, perhaps without the utility sponsored uh, energy efficiency programs. Uh, last I checked about 90% of our industrial customers had opted out. So first off, make sure uh, you, you wanna see if you have opted in or out uh, of the program uh, with us and your large account manager who I suspect is Dwayne, Dwayne Owens can, can check on that for you, okay? Okay, thank you. And then you do an equation. I'm not telling you all anything you don't know, but what you wanna do is an equation based on the products that we can offer uh, you for energy efficiency. And we have a plethora of, prod, of uh, products that we can offer. I mean, for industrial in particular, um, you know, we have process and, and production, uh, products, uh, we got pumps, compressors, uh, just, you know, I, I can, I'm not sophisticated enough, unfortunately, to, to just go through the laundry list, but there's uh, really some great options and you'll wanna do an evaluation of whether uh, the cost of being in the program is greater or less than the advantages you can get from the products that we offer. And I can tell you that, 
um, with a lot of industrials I've worked with or talked to about this, when they have sat down and done the math, um, they have found that it's worth their while to opt into the program. <coughs> and there's some guardrails about opting in and out. You can't just do it, you know, on a monthly basis. But mm -hmm. I found that by opting in and paying a little more in the rates for the program, there's been substantial benefit uh, on the other side. So uh, I think it was kind of an easy decision for most to opt out because it was an immediate two or 3% savings on your bill, which you know is significant. And so, uh, but, I, but for many, when they have done the math, they have found, it, particularly if you're really interested in pursuing some energy efficiency mechanisms, it could very well be worthwhile to, to opt back in the program and take advantage of those. So it takes a little work, it takes some, it takes some math uh, to figure that out. And we can help you with that. Dwayne, if okay. Dwayne Owens is your, your rep, I know he'd be happy to work with you all. Okay. And the other incentive that I, I've been mentioning that is very popular is a, an economic development writer that we have. And mm -hmm. it, it, it applies, if you're looking to grow, uh, it's a it's a very um, or if it's a new facility, but if you're looking to grow in an existing facility, it's a very attractive uh, rider. Uh, and there are some parameters associated with it, but essentially it's a five year um, discount uh, of rates, um, the substantial discount. It's stair stepped, but it's a substantial discount in rates over five years to in, to help incentivize um, any kind of growth. Uh, that you may uh, be uh, encountering. And Dwayne and our economic development team can help with that as well. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, good to hear about this. Yeah. And the second question, the second, it's a little bit longer. <laughs> but oh, uh, yeah, uh, it's more as, as Stan, uh, okay, I mentioned it. Okay, Novel is, okay, is in a carbon footprint program that's okay we have a target to the to reduce 30 percent of our uh, carbon footprint by the 2026 and net zero for the 2020 uh, 2050 okay so uh good question is let know where most the electricity uh, is produced by the duke energy let uh, the, where the, the these energy originate from in the Duke Energy, and what kind, what is the percentage of this each resource? Like, uh, for example, uh, uh, nuclear power, uh, okay, renewable source, or uh, natural gas, or coal. What's the percentage of each of this, uh, these energy that's come from to the to the uh, to the this Indiana? Right. Um, I'm going to answer your question. I wanted to make sure I, I heard net zero by 2050. And was it 30% by 2028? Uh, 2026. That's that's our target. OK. Yeah. Yeah. And, I just, and, I, uh, and uh, part, part of this is related to the energy that electrical energy that we we we, uh, we use uh, in our uh, operations. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, yeah. And uh, sorry, so in addition to this, uh, we'd like to know about the Duke's long-term energy uh, strategy on a sustainability, yeah. uh, such as, uh, okay, uh, renewable energy, like uh, wind and solar uh, generation, as well as a decommissioning of the fossil fuel plants. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you. And may, may I ask just one more question? Is your baseline 2005? Or what's your baseline for those reductions? Okay, that, that, this baseline is uh, is is a two thousand. That's uh, is a this year to uh, two thousand uh, thirty percent is related to the uh, last fiscal year. Oh, yeah, that's ambitious. Yeah, your baseline it's very is very ambitious. Twenty twenty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that is ambitious. Okay. Um, well, let me um, thank you for that. Uh, so we're predominantly, as you, I, I'm sure you know, we're predominantly coal uh, dependent uh, at Duke Energy, Indiana. And uh, a lot of that coal is right here in the Wabash Valley. Historically, um, you know, 
we built generation here in the southwest part of the state and to some extent down in <clears throat> straight southern Indiana uh, because coal is plentiful. You know, here uh, it's, it's, we built the plants right next to the mines and, um, you know, for, for 100 years, that's made sense. Uh, obviously, the, obviously uh, the sentiment mm -hmm. is turning a bit and, and uh, we're, we're reacting to that. Uh, our generation is uh, currently about a little over 70, 71% coal fired generation, 24% uh, natural gas, and the rest uh, would be renewables of one form or the other. So, uh, and you know, we've got substantial plants uh, next door here in Vermilion County, uh, south of here in Gibson County, and uh, and also close by in Knox County. Uh, we're retiring a coal unit, two coal units uh, down by Louisville, Kentucky, across the river and in, on the Indiana side uh, at the end of this month. <clears throat> so uh, your concerns are on our minds as well. And um, <clears throat> what we are, what we did, I'll give you a little bit of historical look and then a bit of looking forward here. Um, we, uh, <clears throat> we had done a, a generation plan. We're required to do generation planning in Indiana every three years. So, and we're in the midst of one right now. So every three years, we look forward 20 years and we project what we think our generation needs will be and how we're going to achieve those needs. And uh, we did our last plan and filed it in November of 2018. The, um, we had accelerated the retirement dates of the Gibson units and the Cayuga units, which accounts for about 4,000 megawatts of generation, uh, a, um, an average of nine years. So 1,000 megawatts at Cayuga is projected to retire in 2028, which doesn't quite meet your 2026 schedule. Uh, and then the Gibson plant has five separate units and they're big, they're 600 megawatts each. Uh, and they're gonna retire in different phases along the way. Uh, one of those units will retire in 2026. Uh, so maybe you'll be able to take advantage of that particular retirement. Four of those units, the four remaining units currently are scheduled to retire in uh, the mid thirties. And so while we're retiring these, un these units, we're gonna be building renewables, uh, both solar and wind, and perhaps add uh, combined cycle natural gas, particularly at Cayuga, <clears throat> because it's well situated. The transmission is there, there's gas there. It's a great site to build uh, a, a substantial combined cycle unit. So we're thinking about this. And as you may know, Duke Energy has goals in this realm as well. Um, uh, you know, net zero by 2050. 2050, okay. Yeah, and 50% by 2030, a reduction. That's, but our baseline is 2005, it's not 2020. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where we are. And, you know, I uh, there's a lot of federal policy discussion on this right now, as you know. Um, uh, depending on how that turns out, it really could drive, um, you know, even quicker retirements. What we have to weigh is, um, you know, we've invested in these units over time. Uh, they're, they're fully environmentally controlled for coal, but for CO2. Um, they have been good units for us. They have run very well. And, you know, the fuel is cheap. So economically, they still compete with, we do these models, uh, those coal units still compete very well. Yeah. <laughs> the forms of generation. So if there's a CO2 tax or price on CO2, obviously that will impact those economic models and we'll you know, see what happens with that. But we're transitioning. We're just not, perhaps sounds like transitioning as quickly as uh, your goals here have been set out, at least the early goals. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, just, ju just for clarification, when uh, we, uh, we mentioned the uh, uh, 2026, the uh, carbon footprint 30%, okay, that's included not just the energy. I think the, the, the part, the largest part is related to the recycling aluminum use. Okay, that means, okay, by, by using the recycling, alu recycling aluminum, okay, we can reduce in 90% uh, in terms of the energy reduction since, okay, that, that's in a normal, Prime aluminum comes from the, the energy intensive uh, operation. Once we use the recycling and recycled aluminum, okay, we reduce significantly this. That, that's why we is aggressive, but we have the reason for to be this. <laughs> this. I see. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That makes uh, sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just one question. Another question is: hide, hide. Do you have any you know, long-term, uh, okay, uh, uh, strategy uh, commercialization of the hydrogen, or or for for for, for your strategy? Yeah, hydrogen has become uh, really a, a hot topic, and um, you know there's still obviously a lot of R and D that has to be done around hydrogen to get it, uh, you know, priced right and in a safe safe manner handled in a safe manner, but, um, yeah. but, you know, combined cycle units, that's really the key. You know, a lot of, there's a lot of folks that don't even want to think about a new gas plant, right? Any fossil fuel for some is, um, is not acceptable. Uh, and, you know, uh, we're asked, excuse me, we're asked sometimes how we can justify building new combined cycle. Mm -hmm. Uh, if our goals are net zero in 2050, because obviously a combined cycle unit would have a 30 or 40 year life associated with it, right? Mm -hmm. So the new turbines that are part of these combined cycles are quite capable of, of using hydrogen as well as natural gas. And so that's a great thing. That's because you can build point. these and depend on natural gas in the short run. And as hydrogen evolves, you know, price-wise, safety-wise, um, otherwise, um, then it can be a, uh, you know, an alternative fuel source for those um, even combined cycle. And the other, you know, the other element uh, of this is uh, the, the possibility of, of carbon capture as well. I, I personally, I think that technology is going to take off. There's going to be a huge demand. There already is. Uh, for the technology, it's too expensive now, but it's another area where I think the, the price will be driven down um, over time because of the demand, if not by coal, then certainly by natural gas, but the demand will continue. So I think there's hope, you know, I think technology is going to help us solve these problems uh, yeah. in the not too distant future. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for joining us today. All right, questions from the group. We have a few minutes left. I don't see any in the chat other than the uh, mention from Commissioner Schweitzer, who I think had to jump off about the, the savings that Duke Energy was able to offer for the jail project that's underway right now in Vigo County. So, okay. yes. $58,000 that took advantage for the new jail. They're going oh, to energy efficiency. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, good. They did. Yeah, great work. Any questions, um, feel free to, we have a small group. You can shout them out. <laughs> Kristen, I had a, had just a couple, if you're okay with that. Yes, go ahead, Steve. This is right, Steve yeah. Holman, who's in health. Yeah, thank you. We're a bit informal today. We're having hospital week as employee employee lunch and things like that. It's good for you. Yeah. So anyhow, <laughs> thank you for doing this. Very informative. I just want to give a shout out to Duke as just being a great uh, community representative with Rick and what you do, uh, financial donations, things like that. Just gr good reputation. I've lived in Ohio and Illinois, and this is the best uh, utility reputation I've seen. I'm just, just candid with you. Thank you for that. Are you ready for another air show, Steve? That's right. We're ready to go. That's right. Um, two quick response. questions. One's will be real fast. Uh, sure. How do we compare here in Indiana on a rate for rates compared to surrounding states or the nation? One. Secondly, if you're willing to, and I understand there's political correctness and everything, but I'm not an, I'm not knowledgeable about coal and clean coal. I just heard that there's been a lot of uh, the way it's burned, the way you utilize it today compared to the way you know 50 years ago is so different compared to renewable energy and the cost for getting to that. Um, and then you see what happened in Texas. 
Um, but just with the, the wind and solar not being enough because they went like 40 some percent. Anyhow, my question to you is, is, is coal really bad uh, in, the, in the transition that occurs to the higher cost, um, taking the politics out of it and everything, you know, what's more of the science of that? So there's two questions, our rate, and then what is this transition and, and got to get to wind and solar, but and, and making sure something doesn't happen like happened in Texas, is, is coal really that bad? So those are two questions, thank you. Um, I wanted to tell you my middle son uh, just graduated from nursing school in St. Louis and we're really proud of him. He, uh, so thank you and to all your folks for the last year in particular. I, I can't imagine what you've gone through as an administrator and, and uh, all your teams. So thank you. Um, so uh, price wise, uh, you know, it, it's a little different uh, by class. Residential, uh, we do really very well, both uh, when you compare our, us to our peers uh, in Indiana and our peers uh, around the Midwest. Um, Duke Energy Indiana does. Commercial, really the same. Industrial, we've, um, you know, all the Indiana utilities, uh, frankly, have had a bit of a, 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 a boom, a boom, I guess, uh, in um, industrial rates over the last 15 years. And uh, while we're still competitive, um, we're not, you know, there were, when I first started in this industry, Indiana had the third or fourth lowest industrial rates in the nation. And now it hovers, you know, uh, at about the 20th lowest, 20 to 25 lowest. Um, and the reason for that, quite honestly, is related to your second question. Um, it's related to coal generation. Uh, you know, Duke, Indiana wasn't the only utility taking advantage of uh, coal that was close by. All of our peers did as well. And in the early 2000s, uh, you know, a lot of investment was being made because of EPA regulation on um, SO2, NOx, mercury, a lot of water regulation. This is, you know, you talk about generation 50 years ago compared to now, and it's, you, you can't compare it. It's, uh, I mean, that our, our plants, we were, you know, we're proud to say that still are, are controlled for um, every emission and you know uh, every discharge of of water um, but for co2 and there just hasn't been a technology developed to capture co2 economically or to you know to treat co2 like you do <clears throat> with the other emissions and so um, the, and the, the cost of that earlier env environmental compliance in the early 2000s really uh, uh, exacerbated our industrial rates much much more than our residential and commercial rates. So it's something we really have paid attention to. It doesn't do us any good to have a an industrial rate that that perhaps someone would argue is not competitive. We we think it's still competitive, but we don't want to get any further down the road. You know, we're at twenty or twenty five now. We don't want to be find ourselves at. Um, you know, 45 or 50 down the road, certainly. Um, but that environment, that, that all that environmental cost in the early 2000s was a, a component of that major component. So with respect to your second question, you know, I, I would frame it a little bit differently. I think the way I have to look at this is the risk involved in our portfolio that we currently have. And uh, I think we have a great portfolio of generation stations um, to serve you all. Uh, we're proud of the facilities. We're proud of the workers um, that we have there. But from my standpoint, there is there's risk. There's you know particularly at the federal level, where you know we've seen a lot of debate about um, you know substantial more. Uh, attention being paid to CO2 certainly than in the last four years. And some of the ideas that have been debated would be punitive uh, for our customers here, you know, uh, and it's around CO2 predominantly. And so uh, from my perspective, you know, we have got to, we're not gonna do this overnight, but we have got to keep 
uh, transitioning our portfolio to a more diverse portfolio. You know, Edwardsport Station in Knox County is unique because, and it's brand new, it's eight years old, but it can use either natural gas or coal as a primary fuel source. The coal is synthesized into a synthetic natural gas. It's really cool technology. Uh, and so it has that flexibility, you know, to use either fuel as a primary source, which is great. I think that's that that plant heading into the future will be a huge asset to us because of that flexibility. You can hedge fuel, uh, you know, prices between coal and natural gas, um, and uh, and even regulation some sort. You can hedge the regulation, uh, fe uh, federal regulation on coal and natural gas by using that plant as well. But, you know, if there's one thing that I've been reminded of over the last um, five months of the new administration and the new Congress is that um, we have to continue down this path of uh, transitioning our generation fleet and alleviating some of that risk uh, that I see in our portfolio. And again, uh, this isn't going to happen in the next five years, uh, seven years, 10 years. It's still going to be a period down the road. And quite honestly, those plants that I spoke about, Cayuga and Gibson, will have lived their useful lives. I mean, mm -hmm. um, by that point anyway, it's not like we were retiring those plants prematurely, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So you had one last question about um, Texas. And... Um, doing okay? Um, we probably will wrap up here pretty soon. Okay. I'll just tell you that what happened in Texas is not going to happen in, in Indiana. And I'll give you just a couple of reasons. One, um, our facilities are ready for, their weather was cold for them, but it wasn't cold for us down there. And our facilities, it was colder here during that week than it was down there. And our facilities ran very well, coal, natural gas, and, um, and renewables in Indiana performed well. Everything down there froze because the equipment was not prepared for that weather. The other quick issue, they have a market that is much different than ours in two ways. Um, we benefit from a, a, a transmission region that runs from Canada down to Louisiana. If we're having a problem, we can get power uh, from our neighbors all up and down that midsection of North America. Texas has only Texas. They decided not to join a regional transmission organization because they didn't want federal oversight of their energy uh, system. And then third, they're a deregulated state where there is no regulation with respect to generation, the cost of generation, uh, the prices they charge their customers. Whereas here, we're fully regulated. Uh, your, your price won't change you know you're going to have generation. We're required here to plan for what happened in Texas. They're not required to do that in Texas. So it's kind of the wild west. And so uh, <clears throat> while we may get frustrated with a regulated utility and, and perhaps not having a choice of providers, I hear that sometimes. Uh, when you look at the Texas mess, I think there's some reason to believe that perhaps we have a better system. So I hope that helps and uh, thank you for your questions and your service. Thank you, Steve. We have one more comment from, well, we had a couple comments, I think from Susan and Jane that were both just really thanking um, Duke for their contributions to the Vigo County Education Foundation, as well as the Terre Haute Children's Museum and all thank the work you. that you do in the community. So thank you all for joining us this morning. I think it was a really, uh, really informative, you know, as I sat here and listened to you speak, it, energy is just such a huge part of our economy, especially our business economy. So it's really interesting to, to hear all the information Information and be able to take that into account. So, thank Stan, you thank you for joining us. But thank we got to keep you on schedule today. You have a big day yeah, here in Terre Haute. So, thank you all. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you.